Well, good evening, church. How good it is to see each one of you here tonight. Grateful to be a part of our final Wednesday night service. I cannot believe that we are here at our last night together. The time has flown by. Seems like just yesterday we started, and yet uh, here we are. Now, I would be <clears throat> greatly remiss if I did not express a family my deepest gratitude uh, for your fellowship, for your hospitality, <clears throat> for your kindness to me. So many of you have said so many nice things. You remember Mark Twain said, I can go two whole weeks on one good compliment. Well, you all have made the rest of my year and into next year because you all have been so kind. And I want to express my gratitude to you and thank you for that. I appreciate you so very much. I love you. And God willing, I look forward to being back uh, when we celebrate our pastor's 30th anniversary. And I would also be remiss if I did not express to Brother Jim and <clears throat> Miss Ruby my sincerest uh, appreciation for their hospitality as well. They have been marvelous, absolutely wonderful. Grateful to God for you, thankful for you, both of you, for the fellowship that we have. And of course, Jim and I occasionally talk on the phone uh, uh, since I was last time I was here, but uh, this is really the first time we've had a chance to kind of renew our fellowship, and it's been good to, for me, and I have enjoyed it and been blessed. And your pastor has so many wonderful qualities. He is a Bible preacher. And those don't grow on trees anymore. And so he is a faithful Bible teacher. You are blessed uh, because he faithfully teaches the word. But he is also humble, and that's what I appreciate about him. He exhibits the spirit of Christ uh, in his life and his demeanor. <clears throat> I've watched him as he relates to you. Uh, and uh, I believe he is a genuinely godly man, as I do believe that about Miss Ruby as well. In fact, there are just so many wonderful things I could say, uh, Brother Jim. As far as I can tell, he really only has one fault. <laughs> he's real bad to cuss when he's drunk. <laughs> but, but, other, but other than that, <clears throat> but other than that, <clears throat> he is okay. <laughs> hey, you should have taken your chance. I mean, you know. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Well, God is good, is he not? All the time. All the time. Lord, do anything in me you need to do in order to do everything through me you want to do. You know, that's a great prayer, isn't it? I wish I could take credit for that. I cannot. Uh, the first time I heard that prayer prayed was at a youth camp in 1980 where I had taken students to youth camp at Falls Creek, Oklahoma. And I was a, a young student pastor and, <clears throat> and in seminary. And I had taken about 21 teenagers up there and there were about 4,000 teenagers in the camp. Um, and uh, Jack Taylor, some of you will know that name, most of you may not. Jack Taylor, Jim will know that name. Uh, Jack Taylor led those kids in that prayer. And I've never <clears throat> forgotten it. I wrote it down carefully that night. And I have asked Christians and church members to pray that prayer with me. I don't know how many times over the last um, 44 years. But it is, a, it is a great, great prayer. We've also learned Job is a great book. And it's been a wonderful time looking through Job, studying Job. Now here's what I've decided to do for the sake of time tonight. I'm going to skip over Elihu's six chapters, 32 through 37. I'm going to give you the summary, which I think is in your notes from yesterday. But other than that, we're going to go straight to God and Job, okay? So that we can spend the most of our time there. Elihu, we don't know anything about. 
We don't know who he was. We know he was younger than the other guys. And we know that he speaks and no one responds to him. Job doesn't respond. Job's other three friends don't respond. He speaks and that's it. God doesn't respond. I mean, Elihu just speaks and then he's off the scene. It's very odd. Now what's interesting about Elihu is what he says to Job is a little bit different than what the other three friends say. In fact, most of what Elihu says is true. It's just that when he gets down to suggesting to Job that Job, maybe you really have sin and you need to repent. Okay, now he goes off the rails with the others. But the basic theology that Elihu articulates is actually pretty good. Lots of good statements in here. We are introduced to him in chapter 32, verses 1 through 5. He makes his apology to the friends for entering the discussion. This is typical Middle Eastern courtesy. Uh, I beg your, your pardon, all of you are older and wiser than I am. And yet, thank you for allowing me. It's typical Middle Eastern deference to those that are older than he is. And then he enters his first speech in chapters 33. And he, and he has four speeches. Each one of the chapters, 33, 34, 35, and 36 to 7 is the final speech. Each of those chapters, those five chapters, Elihu offers four speeches. In the first speech, this is his primary point, his main point. Job, God is not silent. God does speak and he will speak when he is ready to speak. Thank you, sir. He will speak when he is ready to speak. God is not silent. Job number 2 in, ver in chapter 34, Job, God is not unjust. You have accused God of unjustly dealing with you. But Job, the reality is God, because he is God, is not unjust. Number 3 in chapter 35, God is not uncaring. Job, you feel like God is nowhere to be found and therefore doesn't care about you anymore. But Job, that's a mistake. God is not uncaring. And finally, chapters 36 and 37, God is not powerless. God is powerful and he can answer. And in time, he will. He can act and in time, he will. And so as quickly and unusually out of the middle of nowhere, Elihu comes on the scene. He offers his speeches and he fades off the scene. And then we come to chapter 38. And so I want to invite you to turn with me, Job chapter 38. And here's what we have in Job 38 and 39 and the first couple of verses of chapter 40, God himself speaks, Yahweh speaks. And so God comes on the scene and he speaks. And in Job chapter 40 in verses 3 through 5, a little short, short response, Job answers God. But man is it short. And then God says, but I'm not through. Sit back down. And God has a second speech in chapter 40 verse 6 through 41 verse 26, through the end of 41. God speaks twice. And then Job responds a second time to God in chapter 42, 1 through 6. All right? So what, here's what we have. God speaks, Job responds. God speaks, Job responds. And then we come to the epilogue, the final conclusion of the book. So, I don't know if you remember the movie Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Came out back in the 90s. You know, Kevin Costner played Robin Hood. You remember? At the very end of the movie, he's getting married to Maid Marian. And Friar, is it Tucker or Tuck? Friar you know, Tuck is about to perform the ceremony. 
And he's got them saying the vows. And before he pronounces them, you know, man and wife, there are some horses moving in the background, but you can't see who's on the horses. And there's a voice that speaks. And the voice says, hold, I speak. And then the camera turns over there and someone's getting down from the horse and he turns around and of course it's King Richard who's returned from the crusade. And King Richard, of course, uh, made Marion is King Richard's cousin. And what you have here, you've had everything <clears throat> in the movie. You've had everybody else dialoguing and talking. And now in chapter 42, verse 1, God says, hold I speak, is what you have. So we're going to hear <clears throat> what God has to say. So, notice verse, uh, chapter, 40, chapter 38, we're going to begin in faith. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. He said, who is this who obscures my counsel in ignorant words? Get ready to answer me like a man when I question you, when I question you before me. Oh, oh my goodness. Here is God. I want you to stop. remember what God said to Satan about Job in chapters 1 and 2. Remember that? Now look at what God says to Job. God says to Job, Who is this who obscures my counsel with ignorant words? Job. Get ready to answer me like a man. Literally in Hebrew there, it says, gird up your loins. Now in case you don't know what that is, you ladies know what that is. Because the men would wear long flowing robes in that day and time. And when they got ready to do hard work or if they were going into battle, they would reach down and take the both edges of their, the bottom of their robe and pull them up and stuff that in their belt. And then presto, you could Men don't have what that is, but the ladies know what that is. And so you would be able, you would be able to move around quickly. And so God says to Job, you know, put on your big boy britches and answer me. Now, you know that this is not going to be good, probably, when it gets start, when you start like that. You see, <clears throat> Job. God says, who is this that darkens my counsel? Job, and the problem with his three friends, and the problem with Elihu, is none of them saw the issue of Job's suffering clearly, nor did they see it correctly. And so God is going to have to come in and, so to speak, set the record straight. All of the players, including Job, made some false inferences about suffering and about God. So here is Job. He's been looking for answers. He's been calling on God. Take, let's go to trial, God. Stand in the witness stand and bear witness to me. I've got some questions, God. And so now God shows up. The one with the, the answer shows up. But instead of giving answers, he says to Job, sit down. In fact, move over to the witness box, Job. I have some questions for you. So Job is wanting, wanted a dialogue with God. So God's questions. And now God says, Job, I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to ask questions. And so in these two speeches together, God peppers Job with 77 questions. How would you like to go to God? Go with God and it could be renamed. And the first topic is absolutely fascinating. Because God asked Job questions in the next chapters about creation, astronomy, oceanography, meteorology, zoology, and then two mysterious creatures, the Leviathan and Behemoth. And so Job is getting a pop quiz. From God. And he's been looking for answers, and now God says, uh, Before we get to your answers, buddy, I have a few questions for you. And so here we go. Each is designed, each of these questions is designed to question Job's competence to pass judgment on God's providential operation of his earth. So God essentially says to Job, sit down 
and show me your qualifications to run the universe. You know, sometimes we think uh, we, we think we run the universe. Or we think we should. Right? And so God begins to question Job. Job had wanted a legal trial, now he's going to get it. So in verses 4 through 11 God uh, of chapter 38, God says, let's, let's, let's question you about your knowledge of the creation of the earth. Were you there when it was done? Uh, no, it wasn't. What about the oceans? Were you there when they were formed? Do you know how all that works? No, I don't, Lord. And the reason Job couldn't answer is because he was a non-participant. He's striking out. Verses 12 to 15. Job, can you tell me how the earth rotates on its axis? How does light and darkness appear every 24 hours? How does the sea born clothed and can explain that? Job says, Lord, I, I can't because I've memorized or say with light and have I, 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 I Verses 16 through 18. Job, where does the... What is the source of the waters in the sea? What are the depths of the ocean? Can you measure it? The gates of the deep. What about the width of the earth? Get out your measuring tape, Job, and let's measure the width of the earth. Can you do that? And Job says, no, Lord, I can't. In 19 through 24, and nature of light and darkness, Job. Can you explain where snow and hail are stored before they come? Can you tell us about the east wind? Where does it wait until it blows? Again, Job is silent. Verses 25 through 30, Who cleared that path for the rains to fall on the earth? Job, do you know anything about the origin of rain, about the origin of dew, the origin of ice and frost? Tell me, Job. And of course, Job is silent. 31 through 35, Job, tell me about the stars in the sky. How did they get there? How many of them are there? What about meteorology? Can you explain meteorologically how rain occurs? What is lightning, Job? Where does it come from? Job has no answer. 36 through 41, who put wisdom in the heart or gave the mind <coughs> understanding? But wisdom to number the clouds to cause the rain to fall on parched grounds. Job, what is your answer? And Job has none. And then in chapter 38, beginning in verse 39, and moving on to Job chapter 39 and verse 30, God shifts his focus to the animal kingdom. And God says, Job, we're going to take a tour of the Museum of Natural History. And in our tour, we are going to take a look at ten different animals. We're going to look at six animals, actually, and four birds. And then God goes through this list. They're paired in groups of two. And they are designed to show the randomness of God's choice of these examples, which includes some are ferocious and some are helpless, shy and some are strong. And some are bizarre and some are wild. And what in the world, Job, are the reasons for why God made all of these and made them so differently? This is what God is about to do with Job. So the first two animals pertain to providing food for them. Job, how, how do these creatures get their food? Where, where, who feeds them, Job? Do you? And then the next two, giving birth to their young. Have you ever seen how this animal gives birth to its young? And how does that work? And then he queries about Numbers 5 and 6. They have freedom. Where does their feed come from? And then the next two, out of the ordinary ways, and find the last two birds, they have the capacity of flight. The list begins with the lion, concludes with the eagle, the king of the birds. King of animals ends with the king of birds. Job, ten animals here in the Museum of Natural History. How do they do what they do? And who created them with genius? And who provides for them? Do you, Job? And of course, Job <clears throat> cannot answer. And then God says, let's talk about the ostrich in chapter 39, <laughs> verses 13 through 18. 
Have you ever looked, have you ever really just stood and looked at an ostrich? I mean, there's not, I, but either between an ostrich and a camel, I'm not sure if you just look at a camel direct on and he looks like he's got that silly grin. You know, you look at an ostrich and a camel and you see God's humor. Uh, did you know that the ostrich is the weirdest looking bird? It, up to the largest one weighs 300 pounds. They reach a height of eight feet. Eight feet. They have two toes. They're the only animals with two toes and eyelashes. And they have wings, but they can't fly. <laughs> and an ostrich can run 40 miles an hour. Anybody here run 40 miles an hour? God creates this ostrich. Tells Job about this ostrich. Job, can you put that bird together? And then God says in verses 19 through 20, let's talk about the war horse. Job, have you ever seen anything as magnificent as that stallion? Horse ready, fit for battle, in Job's enemy's charge, ready to go. Job, are you anything like that war horse? No. What about the migration of birds? Flying south, Job, how does that work? Who tells them to do that? How do they know to do that? And finally, Job's tour concludes with the eagle and how majestic she is. God ends that first speech in chapter 40, verses 1 and 2, in the same way he began it in Job chapter 38. Listen again, chapter 40, verses 1 and 2. The Lord answered Job, Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who argues with God give an answer. Let's look at that again. Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Peter thought he might correct Jesus on one occasion. Jesus said something and Peter said, Oh, no, Lord, it won't be that way. And Jesus said, Get behind me, Satan. Be careful when you are tempted to correct God. So God ends this first speech, his blitz quiz. Job has been accusing God of contending with him. Now God turns the table. Time for you to answer yes or no, Job. And finally, Job makes his first reply to God. Here's your chance. Job, you've been waiting for this the whole book. You've been waiting and longing for this moment to stand face to face with God and get the answers you feel you deserve. Say, but like Ralphie in Christmas story, Job gets up in the lap of Santa Claus and he totally goes speechless. And he cannot remember to ask for a Red Ryder BB gun. And finally he says, what does he want? A football. And Job pulls a Ralphie. And his response affirms two things. Number one, Job's response, well let's look at it, chapter 40, verses 4 and 5. I am so insignificant, how can I answer you? The first thing Job says to God is he affirms his insignificance before God and his inability to respond to God. Those are the two things, insignificance and his inability. I place my hand over my mouth. I've spoken once. I will not reply twice, but now I can I am insignificant. I am unable. Job is beginning to see what God wants you to see tonight. Job is beginning to see that arguing with God about justice is a no-win proposition. I want justice. Are you sure that's what you want? If God gave me, if God gave you justice, let me tell you where we would be. In a place called hell. 
because of our sin against a holy God. Be very careful that you ask God for justice. Friend, you don't need to. The lady went to the photographer, and when her pictures came back, she was angry. She said, these pictures don't do me justice. The photographer said, lady, you don't need justice. You need mercy. Don't you go asking God for justice. You are in no position to demand justice of God or to actually in, indirectly or directly accuse Him of being unjust with you. So Job may feel, wow, man, this is tough. I'm glad this encounter is over. But God says, oh, wait a minute, Job. Verse 6, we're not done. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. Get ready to answer me like a man. When I question, you will inform me. We're not done yet. I'm not done with you. I want you to answer me like a man. And so now we go to round, <clears throat> round two. And now the key question that gets to the heart of the problem comes in verse 8. Look at it carefully, mark it in your Bible. Would you really challenge my justice? Would you declare me guilty to justify yourself? There is probably the heart of Job's problem. Yeah, Job wanted to an answer. He wanted the why question answered. But in the process, Job stepped across the line and challenged God's justice with him. And God is calling Job's hand. Look at it. Would you declare me, God says, would you declare me guilty in order to justify yourself? I want you to stop and think deeply with me for a moment. What did Job's three friends do to him? They condemned Job in order to justify themselves and their belief and their theology. Now God says, Job, what your friends did to you, you are doing to me. Would you declare me to justify yourself? And so then, beginning in verse 10... Suddenly there's a period of time, a period, a section here between 10 and 14, where God doesn't ask a single question. Instead, he pummels Job with several declarative statements that function like questions with the single intent of helping Job to see this. Who is omnipotent over all creation and therefore who is competent to criticize God's justice? Job, who is that person? Would that be you, Job? Are you sovereign, omnipotent over all creation? You already couldn't answer any of my questions. You flunked my pop quiz. Do you dare to claim that you to criticize me? You see, this is what we need to hear tonight. Well, but David, you don't understand. My daughter, uh, uh, no. No, uh, but you don't understand. I wiped out of... Uh, no, no. Uh. Who are we to question the justice of God and how He runs His universe? Now, let me make a statement. Some of you are not going to fully follow me. You're going to be, get a little irritated, but I, I want you to think deeply. You know I love you. And I want you to listen carefully to what I'm about to say. God owns you. He does not owe you. 
God doesn't know you anything. Everything you are and everything you have is by His grace. Are you a deserving sinner? No, you're not. Am I a deserving sinner? No, I'm not. None of us is. Who are you, Job, to question how I run my universe? And who are you, Job, to question what I permit to go on in your life? Now this is the same God who said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There ain't nobody like him anywhere. But you see, God is not in the habit of sending out thank you notes for what you do for him. He owns you. And your suffering and your bitterness toward whatever past suffering or present suffering that you're going through will never be resolved until you cross this Rubicon tonight. These verses right here. We're at the crux. We're at the crux of the issue. And then God says to Job in verses 10 and following, I'll tell you what I want you to do, Job. I'm going to wave my magic wand and I'm going to let you be the ruler of the universe for me. So you put on the clothes of majesty and power and run the universe for a day. (laughs) And let's see how you do. And then God says, now I'm still not through, Job. So in verse 15, all the way through the end of 41, God takes Job on a prehistoric stock and rodeo show. We as Texans ought to be able to appreciate that. And so he introduces us to two animals. I'm just going to quickly cover them. Behemoth and Leviathan. Now when you read all this poetic language about these two, you almost feel like, wow, this is kind of mythological. And there are two views of what may be going on here. Every culture has a mythology, which they don't believe is real, but it's a part of their mythology. And it's very possible that the author of Job is using mythological creatures of chaos that were common in the early, in the early uh, patriarchal period. But I don't think that's what's happening. I think Job, the author of Job, whomever he is, is actually referring to two different kind of animals. That is the us, and I think Leviathan is the crocodile. And when you read through them, the descriptions fit perfectly. Now there's a lot of metaphorical language here. It talks about how when Behemoth uh, blows, the wa- blows through his snout, it's like fire comes out. Notice he says, not fire, but if you've ever seen this, in the begin, early morning or late evening seen pictures of a hippo blows the sun, angle of the sun through the spout of the water looks like fire. And so all of these details can be explained by, of, of these literal animals and basically what God says about the hippopotamus and about the crocodile, Leviathan, the crocodile is number one, he's impossible to capture. Verses 1 and 2, chapter 5. It's impossible to domesticate him. Ever seen a domesticated crocodile? No, you haven't. I've seen people uh, who thought they had domesticated one, you know, and the croc's mouth big open at the circus, and the guy sticks his head in there. Have you seen this one on Facebook on your video feed? Sticks his head in there, and the croc goes, and, gets, and he's got his head stuck in there, and he's trying to get out. Yeah. You know, you can't pay me enough money to do that. I mean, you've got to be some kind of crazy. You can't domestic a crocodile. So God continues his description in verse 7 and 9 and say it's virtually, virtually impossible to kill one. And Job, can you, make, can you make behemoth? Can you make Leviathan? And then in 41, 12 through 34, God continues his detailed description of Leviathan, probably the crocodiles, and then his inability to be captured, 26, 34. That's what you have there. So God continues to pepper Job with these questions. And then God is teaching Job, Job, 
I refuse to be domesticated by you. Now here's the next lesson. I hope you're listening because you need to walk out of here with this. God cannot be domesticated. You cannot put him in a box. You don't control him. And this is what some of you raised an eyebrow when I said a couple of months ago and then you understood later. And now you're saying, this statement, God can't be trusted. And some of you are about ready to accuse me of heresy. And then I finished when I said, God cannot be trusted not to allow you to suffer. Don't you expect for one minute that God will exempt you from suffering. Oh, Lord, I trust you, you let me get this cancer, or my kid died, or my whatever. No, yeah, uh-huh. No. Can God be trusted? Of course he can. You know what I'm saying. I'm about going out of here, you know, saying I'm a heretic. Of course God can be trusted. My point is God can't be domesticated by you. You can't, you can't wrangle with God to say, here's what I want and will permit in my life, but here's what I don't accept from your hand. Job teaches us. God, you can do anything you want in your universe. You can't touch my children. You can do anything you want in the universe, but you can't touch my spouse. Jim Elif years ago was president of the Southern Baptist International Mission Board. I'm sorry, Tom Elif. I said Jim, that's a brother. Tom Elif. His wife was dying of cancer, stage four. And just before, or shortly before she died, Tom told me this story. He said she was lying in the hospital bed, and it was a very bad evening. And Tom, who'd been a pastor for many, many years, he said, I just sort of lost it with God. And I never said anything verbally, but I just, my mind is like Job. And he said, as clear as a bell, not an audible voice, but he said, God spoke to me, David, and here's what he said. God pointed to her body on that bed and then looked at me and said these words, yours or mine? You see, God, in the book of Job, is asking a question of all of us. Yours or mine? And when you get the right answer to that question, then you will have learned the lesson. And so Job finally learns the lesson. And his final response, we're almost through, is in 42, verses 1 through 6. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything, and no plan of yours can be thwarted. You ask, who is this who conceals my counsel with ignorance? Surely I spoke about things I did not understand, things too wondrous for me. You said, listen now, and I will speak. When I question you, you will inform me. I had heard reports about you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I checked my words and am sorry for them. I am dust and ashes. The best manuscripts read not I repent in dust and ashes. And that may be, include that, but the best manuscripts actually include, basically have Job say, saying I am dust and ashes. Lord compared to you I'm sitting in a dump the trash dump of my town, and I am what I'm sitting on. 
when it comes to you. Now, when you get to that point, then you will understand. When you can get to that point, God is omnipotent and sovereign, like you. You are ignorant about God's ways. Job, God has revealed himself directly to you just like he has Job. And Job's repentance was the proper response to the revelation of God. And so let me tell you what you need. You don't need answers. You need God. And that's what Job discovered. When answers aren't enough, there's Jesus. Remember that song? And let me ask you this. What difference would it make if you had an answer anyway? Somebody still died. The family was still disrupted. He still left you alone and ran off with another woman. What all those things are going to be chased. What what difference does it make even if you had an answer? You see, God, here's what's interesting. Now stay with me. We're almost done. The whole book of Job, all the times. There, by the way, in the book of Job, there are 300 questions. 77 of them by God, the other 200 and whatever by Job's three friends and Job. And one of those questions is why? Over and over and over again. And the interesting thing about the book of Job is God never tells why. Because that's the wrong question. Here's the right question. The right question I put in my author's dedication in this book. To those who have suffered and ask why. To those wounded healers, we call preachers who have preached. To those asking why. To those who have asked why and then discovered that is the wrong question. To those who asked the right question, who, and found their answer. In him. December of 2011, my wife Sherry and I went into the doctor's office for a follow up, and I knew it was not good because the doctor's face told me that. He had been our doctor for a long time. And he said, Sherry, I've got to tell you, you have cancer, and it's stage four. We've got to immediately get you to an oncologist and get you on treatments. And he he was nearly in tears. That began a three-year and month journey in our life. Fifty chemo treatments. Three surgeries. And all that goes along with fighting cancer where the cure is as bad as the disease. And then one Wednesday morning at 10.02 a.m. in 2015, the Good Shepherd came into our bedroom 10.02 a.m. and called his lamb home to be with him. And I'd been a pastor for many, many years. I've walked with many people through their suffering. And I've stood by many a graveside as a pastor. But is your own and blood, a spouse or a child, everything changes. And I learned lessons from the book of Job during that time. That God taught me about himself and how his grace is sufficient for me. And I never dreamed how God would use my wife's cancer and her response to it by faith and endurance to touch so many lives. She started a little <clears throat> prayer email that at first went out to 10 of her in church and then it went to 20 and then it went to 50 and then it went to 100 and then 
people began to ask it to go to them and it began to be spread all over the place. And I remember the month that Sherry died, I was sitting in our bedroom and she was asleep in the bed, hospice care. And I received an email, it was about 11.45 p.m. The email said, Dear Sherry, because I was the one who you know, would check all of her emails. And this is what the email said, I am an American Airlines pilot. I've just finished my run to New York and I'm about to return when I received your latest email. And then he went on to say the greatest sermons we ever see are sermons that are lived out in the midst of our suffering. And he thanked her for her faithfulness and how she had been a blessing, an American airline pilot in New York, getting ready to return to Dallas. We got dozens of emails like that. Because you see, the wonderful thing about God is when He allows you to go through suffering, not only is His grace sufficient for you, but He gives you a broader ministry on the other side of your suffering. Even if your suffering ends in death, God, Romans 8, 28, is still true. Well, we know that all things work together to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. I cannot tell you what I learned about God during those days, but I can tell you this. Every promise He ever made to me in that book he has kept. And though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Because like Job, I'm learning. I'm learning. Like you, we're learning what it means to be a child of the king. Amen? All right, well, I, I went 13 minutes longer, I guess, than I intended to. So, we still maybe take, what, five minutes, preacher? Yeah. What do you want to ask? And I'm going to sip on that water that you were kind enough to give me. Thank you, thank you, sweet lady. All right, my microphone lady's back there. What do you want to ask? This is something I'm just curious about. There was a lot of uh, dialogue that uh, goes on, a lot of detail about what these guys are saying and everything like that. How could the author remember everything that they said? It, yeah, whoever the author is, this is a divinely inspired book. Absolutely. And that's the only way. God, he is getting his information unless, unless it was someone present, which is possible. Mm -hmm. That would mean we probably don't know who wrote it. There are some people who think Job wrote the whole thing uh, except for the little tail end about his death and that right. that was added. Now that's a possibility. Right. But, uh, but the only answer to that is divine inspiration. Mm -hmm. God had to inspire all of that information presented accurately. Right. <clears throat> Who's next? Anybody? How much would you charge for me to take you with me the next church I go to to carry my <laughs> microphone? I don't know that I can afford you, but you do. I can't. Okay, I can't. You do a great job, I tell you that. You do a great job. All right, anybody else? You got a question or a comment or whatever? Okay, right here. <clears throat> so in chapter 1 and 2... God told Satan that that's my boy. But you know, Job really failed. He failed the test. It was Jesus or God who made him okay because questioning God is not right. So Job, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but 
I, I, think, I think I know what you're trying to say. And I, I think I agree with you. The hero of the book of Job is not Job. The hero is God. The hero of the Bible is God. And, and, and all of us, including Job, even though he was a great man of faith, and God never criticizes Job at the end like he does the three friends. In fact, God says, now you three friends have not spoken truthfully about me. Job and ask him to pray for you and I will forgive you. And so the book of Job begins with him praying for his children and ends with him praying for his friends. The book of Job begins and ends in prayer. And it's the only people that pray in the book is Job. And so, yeah, Job didn't aim line of, you know, nearly going over into, into uh, blasphemy, but he never did. And so all that was good. But the problem, what Job was trying to do ultimately was to justify himself to God. And the only way to do that is to throw God under the bus. That's the only way to justify yourself. Write this one down. The only way to justify yourself before God, you will sooner or later wind up throwing God under, your bu- under the bus. And, and when you do that, God says, uh-uh, no. Who are you? Universe, try one day. So that, I know, I, I know what you're saying. I do. And, and ultimately, that's why the first Adam blew it. Adam and Eve blew it. And we're all, we're all sinful. But the second Adam, Christ, won our victory. And we're going. And so no matter what, life or death, our, we are in his hands. One more. If you, if you want one more. All right. Let me say, finally, thank you, love you, appreciate you. You have been gracious, loves teaching, preaching to you. You all are so eager to receive the word, and that's because your pastor has been faithful through the years preaching that word, and so you are a testimony to him. And obviously he doesn't cuss when he's drunk. (laughs) So let's make sure we get all that straight. I truly love Brother Jim, I do. Thank you all for allowing me to be here. Brother Jim, thanks for allowing me to be here. Appreciate you. (laughs) But you got there, amen? Just go ahead and take that last little bit. We're not going to let you go without it. You know, we've, we've been eating out this week, and we've had a great time eating out. But you know, every time we eat out, you know what they give us at the end of that meal? A ticket. They want us to pay for them fixing that meal for us. Well, you know what? We don't do it with expectation, but we ought to, we ought to pay for the meal we've received this week. Amen? And I don't know about you, what little bit I put in that plate couldn't even begin to touch what I received. Amen? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, God, for what we've heard this week and how, God, you've touched our hearts. You've reminded us, God, that you are God. We are not. And that we have a wonderful Lord and Savior that graces us with life itself. And, Lord, forgive us when we become human. The question is, might we learn, Father, that it's not about questions. It's about accepting. It's about looking for that wonderful truth that you're trying to teach us. And we love you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.